So my name's Andrew Burgess. I'm a management consultant. I advise our disruptive sourcing, innovative sourcing areas. And today I'm going to talk to you about robotics and artificial intelligence and how they're going to impact society and outsourcing and else. Okay, so I need a clicker. That's what I need. So let's take a step back in time, just work out now. So 40 years ago, the first mobile phone played in, uh, on a street corner in New York. So this is the chief executive of Motorola doing that to call. 30 years ago, the internet didn't even exist. So this is a chap uh, reading something we used to call a newspaper. Uh, 20 years ago, um, 130 websites in existence, and Google won them. Ten years ago, most of these websites didn't exist. Okay? So nowadays, it's all ubiquitous. They're, these websites are everywhere. They, they help us run our lives. So today, people talk about today being the age of the robots. But why today? Why is now the robots? Well, you know, if you go back to when I left university, my first job was in Rover in Cowley. And these are the robots we used on the production line. And, you know, so that was, that was 1988. So why now? Well, I think there's four big drivers for why robots are, are, are the thing now. I think the first thing is obviously big data. There's so much more data that people can exploit and, and use, and particularly, for, you know, computers and robots. But also storage, storage is now much cheaper. It's, uh, it's much easier to access all of that big data. And then as well, the processing speeds of the computers that use that data is much faster as well. So we can do much more with that, with that data. And finally, importantly, it's around connectivity. So all these things, all these computers and robots connected together. And it's interesting, even robots have their own repository of information called robots. It's a bit like the sort of Wikipedia for robots. So even the robots getting in on the act. And if you look back uh, in time again, you know, his, 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 this is how, how things have, have developed. So this is, um, this is not even a computer. This is a hard drive being loaded onto a plane in, in 1956. The capacity of that hard drive was five megabytes. Okay, so it's probably enough for one Taylor Swift song. Okay? If you go to 1975, here's a, an IBM computer, uh, sort of a small size office computer that costs you under $18,000. And if you move to 92, here's another hard drive, obviously much smaller now, double the capacity of megabytes, that's two Taylor Swift songs you can get on this, and only for $3,390. So you can see things have developed very, very quickly. So I want to talk about those robots, and I want to make sure that we understand which robots we're talking about. I've categorized them into three different types. So there's physical robots, there is the robots, and then there's the intelligence robots, the artificial intelligence. So I'm going to talk, my talk's not going to be about physical robots, but I'll just take you through that to, to this fascinating subject in a bit. Very, very quickly, whiz through. So there's, there's some robots like back which work on a production line. Uh, they, they're very safe. So normally robots like in Austin Rover have to be caged up because they're very dangerous. These ones, if it hits a person, it stops moving completely. Uh, you can train it by moving the arms around. Um, it's, it's very, very um, cheap to buy. It's cost about 15,000 pounds to buy robots. So you can see that, you know, de developments in, in robotics there. Uh, if you ever bought anything from Amazon, then your parcel would have been probably carried by one of these orange boxes, move all the, all the uh, parcels around the warehouses. A company called Kiva developed those and then bought. So these are all completely automated robots. And then there's restaurants in Japan manned completely by robots. So they do all the cooking and the serving. And even I was looking the other day, there's a hotel in Japan uh, called the Henar Hotel, which means weird hotel, which is, again, is manned almost exclusively by robots. There's cars, fascinating subject in itself, and uh, you know, medical robots as well, so a robotic surgery. So the whole physical robots is, 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 is fascinating in itself, but we're really about talk to you about virtual robots. And people call, call this uh, robotic access automation, or RPA. Uh, so just to give you a definition of what, what RPA is, the flexible uh, use of flexible software tools to automate manual activities, the delivery of business processes or IT services. And the key words there is automate manual activities. Okay, so what we're doing, we're taking jobs that humans would not do to process stuff, and we're getting software to do that instead. So the best way to explain that, I think, is by analogy. So some of you may have heard this expression before, swivel chair process. So if, imagine somebody's doing um, a loan application, somebody has to process a loan application. So the application comes in, 
They might key in all the data into their CRM system, then do a credit check on another system, and then they go and do maybe a KYC check on another system. Then they go back and they, they put a zero in front of the account number on their original system because they do. So this constant going from one system to the other is called swivel chair processing. And that's the old, um, application for robotic process automation. Whereasly, you're, you're essentially integrating all those systems at the presentation layer with human beings, really an over-engineered solution, you can now get robots to do that work for you, so to take human being out of the process. Okay? So it's, it's, it's a big step in terms of what the robots can do and what they couldn't do. Just to give you an idea of some of the processes that they automate. So these are live examples. So customer onboarding processes, uh, chat process, financial services, um, oops, few, too many there, uh, on the completion of trades uh, and transactions for financial services firms, fraudulent enclosure. Obviously very important in, in that case, if, if some account is compromised, you've got to close everything down very, very quickly. So the robots are very good accessing all those different systems and going through essentially the list of everything that has to be done to do all the stuff and everything's auditable and can done very quickly. So very, uh, very compliant process. Uh, there's compliance reporting to the FCA, loan application opening I've talked about, uh, SIM card processing. Um, this is an interesting one. If, if you've ever changed your mobile phone uh, and you want to keep the same number, so you, you have your, your, your SIM card and you, and you have to ring up the company and you read out that tiny little number on, on the SIM card and then they tell you, well, if, if in 24 hours, if you turn your phone off and on again, it may or may not have transferred over. If you're with O2, you go online, you put that number in, 10 minutes, your, your number is transferred. And the interesting thing is, that press not touched a human being at all, so it's all done completely automated. Uh, some basic processes like uh, accounts receivable and uh, automated voice processing, all of these are applications or processes that can be, uh, that, that robot process automation can, can be applied to and has been applied to. So some numbers to demonstrate the, the effect of, uh, of robotics. So 0.5 is the number of days that a, a primary healthcare trust uh, close their month end books. It did take them 12 days, now it takes them half a day. So they now expect to use half the amount of people they, they used for that. So not only are they doing it much quicker, they're doing it with, with, with much less people. One is the number taken to complete a compliance audit at a major bank, and that used to take them seven hours. So again, robots going around hoovering up all that information from all the different systems and putting it into, into one point and reconciling it at that, at that point. Uh, there's a bank in the UK uh, that has used it for the early stages of debt recovery. Made it's, it's a, enabled them to uh, recover an additional £175 worth of debt by using the robots. Uh, this is a client um, of mine. I, I, I work for a company called Symphony Ventures, by the way. We, do, we work a lot in, in the implementation of robotics automation and AI. So this is a client of ours. The ROI numbers are large, so 12, 1,200% ROI is not untypical. Very often it's 600% up to, up to these sorts of numbers as well. And not only are they low, they're very quick. So here's an online retailer based up in, in Manchester. For one test, they, they achieved um, their ROI within one month. It can also be done at scale as well. So uh, a major utility, again, they implemented RPA. They're an early adopter of this. They've been doing it a few years. Um, but they've served 250 people uh, in, in their business using RPA. But the costs, and this is where it gets really interesting, the cost of implementing a software robot compared to an offshore BPO FTE is around about word. To compare it to an onshore FTE, it's about a ninth. See, when you're looking at this, the business case almost falls out of, 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 of the process that you're looking at. And of course, zero, is the amount of time that robots need for, slip, for, for sickness, sleep, eating, etc. Okay. So the benefits are big. If you look at the companies that, that use RPM, this is a, a selection of those. Some of them are very early on in their, in their uh, implementation of RPA. Some of them are, um, are uh, very, very far down the road. But you, know, you can see some very big names there looking, looking at this um, technology. So I just want to cover as well briefly, so that's, that's the, the virtual robot. Look at the artificial intelligence because the two of those complement each other very well. So if you look at it, a spectrum, I guess, an automation landscape. So that's a pointer here. 
Yes, sir, it's good. So, so if you look at the, um, the input, so this, the inputs to access can be structured, semi-structured, or unstructured. So structured data would be something like sheets. Semi-structured would be something like uh, an invoice or a contract. So there's certain things in there that you would expect, but they might be in different places. And then unstructured could be something like a, a customer email, could say anything. So the robots work in this area, because effectively they, they are dumb. They will do exactly what you tell them to do. So they're very rules-based. But once you get into the semi-structured, then that's when you start to need uh, different sorts of capabilities. So that's when you need to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and cognitive technologies. So th although this looks like a, a continuum, there's a very big difference between the structured uh, here and the unstructured and semi-structured uh, cognitive here. But I think the best way to explain AI is by example. So here's, um, here's an example we use on a, a client of ours in the insurance business. So they work in the Lloyd's market. So a lot of their policies come in on paper. So the first thing is scan them. But they want to get all the information off of those policies uh, very quickly. So at the moment, they, sent them, they scan them and they sent them to an LPO provider in Chennai to work. So that's the work that... So they would... The uh, Indian people read through the policy. They would extract the relevant information, such as you know, the value parties, the termination date, and then put that into a system of record. So what the AI system can do is read through those same policies, understand what's written there, and extract that same information. So immediately you save the cost PO provider by putting in that AI system. It becomes much more in though if you think about the historical information that that, that, that um, company has. So this is, this is a very old insurance business. They actually insured the Titanic, which might not have been the best move for them. But they've got lots and lots of historical information. And the beauty of using the AI, you can look through all of that uh, historical information, extract all that relevant information, and because those are, um, those are policies that, that have uh, that matured, we know how successful they were. So we can assess them ag against how well they, the, the business was written in the first place. So you can, our system can take that, and the, and the people can learn how to run a better insurance business based on that information. So even if you, know, if you write billions of dollars worth of insurance every year, and you can improve that, that, that by, say, you know, 0.25%, a lot more than saving the cost of an LPA provider. So the value for AI is, is actually going to be very, very big indeed, and probably much greater than any robotic process automation can do as well. So although it's more of a, a name technology, um, it's going to have a much bigger impact in the future. And the interesting thing, I said that these two technologies play well together. So if you have unstructured uh, data inputs, say custom emails coming in, you apply that through the AI system, and then you get structured data. And of course, once you've got structured data, then the robots can then pass that information. So if you look at some processes, they, you, can, you can take them from the beginning of the customer writing in right through to the resolution of that, even if you know, sending them a, a letter with whatever the resolution is without touching a human being at all. So completely auto using RPA and AI technologies. So that's, that's what RPA and AI is. I want to really talk about how it's going to affect um, us as people and society and the work that we do. So is it going to be all um, doll cues and soup kitchens? Are we all going to be out of work, out of work in the future? If you look at this graph, then probably yes. So this red line here, which represents the employment to population ratio, and you can see after the recession in 2000 dropped dramatically. But if you look at the dashed line, which is profits, they dramatically as well. So something's happening here. The number of people in, in work is going down, but the numbers are going up. So the clue lies in this green line, which is corporate investments, which is also rising as well. So companies are investing, but they're not investing in people. They're investing in capital, and they're investing in machines to do that work. Okay, so that's the difference now. It's moving from a based workforce to a machine-based workforce. And if you look in, into the future, you project. So the red line is, sorry, the, the, the blue line, working age population, which you imagine is going up just as, as the, the world expands. The number of jobs is going up, but in the same rate as the population. So you get this widening jaw of jobs, which means you know, there's less work around to do. As an example, if you look at uh, these four companies, so probably the four most influential companies in the US, that's Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple, their combined market capitalization is over $900. 
they employ less than 190 people across all those four people. Okay? If every company in the future is like that, there's going to be a lot less work for everybody to be doing. And that works out about $5 million per employee that they're, that they're worth. So what, what can we do as a society to ensure that we don't get this post-apocalyptic um, work uh, world where nobody, nobody's in work? So I think there's a few things that, that, that we can do and we can start to So first thing I should say is, for me, this, this is half full, so I'm an optimist. So what I'm going to focus on is, is the good things. Interestingly, if you, if you Google glass half empty, you get 8 million coming back. If you Google glass half full, you get 64 million results. So the world shares my optimism to a certain extent. So every time you, check, you, know, you, you ring up and you press 1 to check your balance, or use an ATM to get cash out, or you click on now on an online site, you're doing a process that used to involve a human being and doesn't anymore. And that's something that's been around for years already. And I think the businesses that will, get, that will suffer because of this, bookstores is a good example. You know, there's only a few now, good chains remaining, you know, now dominated by, by companies like Amazon. At the end of the day, you know, who, who laments the loss of the lamplighter? So you know, things have moved on, and why, why, do they, why do they not lament that? Because it's all about customer service. It's much easier now to get your cash out of the ATM, to go on uh, to, sorry, to go online to um, to buy things and to flick the switch rather than get your lamplighter to do it for you. And if you remember back to that O2 example I talked about, that's all about customer service. The, the customers who want that 10-minute online service run ringing up and waiting and, get, and, and the 24-hour process. So it's going to be driven customer demand. And at the end of the day, the customers aren't really going to care whether there's a person on the end of that, of that process or not. They're just going to want that customer service. Look at the impact of computers and the internet. You know, everyone uh, 20 years ago said that it was going to have a huge impact on productivity. But that hasn't really appeared as, as, as great and expected it to be. And that's because the computer industry has created own overheads, so you know, chip manufacturing plants, uh, IT help desks, uh, data standards uh, officers. All of these things are all created new, and if you look at particularly, um, you know, they created even new businesses such as online gaming or movie streaming that didn't exist before computers. And I'd suggest the same thing is probably going to happen with robotics, and it's going to create new jobs for us and new businesses that come up that we haven't even thought of yet. And as well, with a computer, you have to do all these things. And just with robots, you know, whether they're physical or virtual, you've still got to design them, build them, market them, sell them, maintain them, regulate them, fix them, upgrade them, and dispose of them. All of that will require work to do. And if you think about the work that is automated, so it's, it's going to be that, re that menial task, the, the drudgery task that everyone does. And these are the sorts of tasks people, people only go to work for to get a salary to, to, do, to do that work. It's not rewarding work. So if the robots can take that work away from them, it frees them up to do more rewarding work. Okay? And some of those more rewarding things could actually be not working at all. So there's a challenge to get the distribution of wealth correct through into this, into this robotic world. But if we can get it right, then we can move to a four-day week or even a three-day week, and I think anyone in this room will probably welcome that as, as we go forward. So, how can we make sure that we get this nice positive outcome on the beach on a Friday rather than the post-apocalyptic world? I think there's a few things that this can do. One is obviously education. Um, there's lots of things that need to change in education to, get, to prepare uh, young people for, for this new world. And you know, any of you got children going through school at the moment? But you know. The, some things are happening, but it's just not. You know, when I look at the jobs that are available now that we're recruiting for, they're very, very different than the, than the that people have been learning about in, in school at the moment. So, I think you know, in order to do, we need to focus a lot on the, those classic subjects like physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics, but also the subjects that can help us exploit technology as well, such as computer engineering, entrepreneurship, psychology. All these need more focus than they've got at the moment. And then there's infrastructure. We need more infrastructure as well, because even in a robotic world, humans are going to have to move around. We're going to communicate. We're going to want to have to drive to different parts of the country, probably in our driverless car. But also because robots aren't very good at building bridges. If you, 
from a business point of view as well, if, if, you, if you have a process to build rubbish TVs and you automate, all you do is you're still building rubbish TVs. So there's still a role for knowledge workers to say, what's the best process for building televisions? How can, I, how can the change management um, challenges for building TVs? So there's still a lot of work around the processes that, that how, how to automate as well. So I'm going to leave you with uh, a quote and a number. Okay? So the quote is from uh, a chap called Andrew Macker who wrote a couple of books. One's called Rage Against the Machine. One's called Second Machine Age. Both very good books. He's an MIT professor. So he says... Resisting the robots is futile. They're going to keep improving and companies are going to keep buying them. And more fundamentally, resisting is misguided because it's exactly the same as resisting progress towards a post-drudge, post-sweatshop world. And that's, that's where the hope is, I think. Why would you not may from taking the, those worst end of the jobs, the drudgery, the menial people only do for salary, in, sometimes in sweatshops, and get robots to do that, to do that instead? So let me paint you a little picture of what that future might look like. 90% of your co-workers will be unseen machines. You will only do the work. You, it's not, you won't be paid in terms of how you work. It's how well you're going to work with machines. That's going to be the important thing. So I said let the, the robots take over. I think we're going to let them do the work that we could do. And they're going to do the work that we can't even the work that we can't do at the moment, and probably do stuff that we can't even think about, we never imagined before. So I think the robots will give us the opportunity to become more human than we have ever been. Thank you very much. <laughs>